All right, my friends, let's finish out chapter two. Finish it out. All right, low liquidity investments. You know what liquidity means, the ability to quickly convert an asset into cash at a fair price. Well, these investments don't have a lot of liquidity, okay? And they're often referred to as alternatives. And this has become, again, very popular it's in the last 20 years for investors to diversify their portfolios into these low liquidity investments alternatives. And the marketplace is constantly coming up with new products and constantly looking for ways to create liquidity where liquidity did not exist before, like real estate. You can buy and sell a REIT on an exchange and you can own apartments or office buildings in various parts of the country without getting into locking your money up in real estate. Well, it's the same thing with these um, with alternatives. All right. So what, they are characterized by having very fragmented markets. They don't have good li liquid markets, like with the real estate markets are not liquid. If you want to buy and sell a piece of real estate, it could take a couple of years to get it down. Okay? The transaction costs are high. Listen, when you go to buy a house, it's probably going to cost you 7 or 8% to buy a house. Whereas if you want to buy a stock, it will cost you uh, less than 1% to buy into a stock. Okay? Lack of liquidity, again, uh, tough to find a buyer or a seller. You don't know what the price is going to be. Okay? Not good market pricing, hard to know what your asset's worth. Okay? These are all characteristics of a low liquid investment. All right, so let's look at some of the classifications of low uh, uh, liquid investments or alternative investing. Direct lending, okay? This is investing in companies that then loan to high-risk borrowers, okay? Subprime. Private real estate, okay? Directly investing in real estate as opposed to going through a REIT. Collectibles, antiques, Cars, art, coins, stamps, wine, diamonds, things like that. These are collectibles. Low liquid investments. All right? Private equity. This has become a real hot area. Private equity. It's kind of a newer term. It's, the term has been around about 10 years. Prior to 10 years ago, we called it venture capital. And these are firms, financial companies, that invest in early stage companies or in trouble companies that are that they're trying to turn around. Buy low, sell high, add value. Buy low, add value, sell high. Mitt Romney, when he ran for president, he uh, was the CEO, still is CEO of Bank Capital, which is a private equity firm. Warren Buffett, basically that's what Warren Buffett does. Listen folks, if you or I buy 100 shares of Walmart, we are not adding value to Walmart. Okay, when we call up Walmart management and say we think you ought to lower the price of this or we think you ought to add this new item into your inventory, do you think they listen to us? Maybe we call Walmart's um, management and say we, we think you ought to take out uh, more loans and buy back some stock. Do you think they listen to us? The answer is no, they do not. Let's check the recording here, make sure everything is good with our recording. All right, we're good. Um, but when Warren Buffett or Mitt Romney buy a company, they directly influence management. What are they trying to do? They're trying to add value. They want to buy the, co the company uh, low and sell it high. And that's what private equity is. Okay? So again, the objective, add value to the companies and then sell them at a profit. Okay? If you don't add value, long-term value, you're not going to sell the assets at a profit. Okay? So some people call these people vultures. They are not vultures. They are trying to add value, okay? Because if they don't add value, they're going to lose money. All right. There, when you invest in a private equity fund, there's often a period of time, which is called a lockup period, where investors cannot withdraw any money from their investment. And it could range from three years to 10 years. So when you put your money in, there's, there's almost no liquidity, okay? The managers of these firms often participate in the profits from the investments. So they get a paid a management fee, and then they're also, they also own part of the projects, and when they sell the projects for a price that's higher than what they paid, they make profits on it themselves. And this is called carried interest, when a manager gets carried interest. All right, 
a master limited partnership, another type of low liquidity or alternative um, investment, although the liquidity of these is much better than for other investments. These companies have to limit their activities to, this is by law, commodities, natural resources, which really are commodities, or, or real estate. Okay, And in fact, most master limited partnerships are natural gas pipeline companies. Companies that build pipelines to transport natural gas, almost all master limited partnerships, own pipelines. This is the way that pipelines are financed. Companies are set up as partnerships, and so a partnership does not pay any federal income taxes. A corporation does. A corporation is a separate legal and taxable entity with their own tax table. A, the, a partnership does not pay uh, income taxes on their income. They, they pass their income directly to the partners. They, now, that doesn't mean they make distributions. That means each partner owns a share of the income, and then each partner has to calculate their own taxes. They have their own tax rates, and so you don't pay taxes at the business level. Okay. Um, master limited partnerships pay large dividends. That's why people invest in master limited partnerships, to get um, large dividends, and hopefully they'll buy and the value of their pipeline will go up over time and maybe they'll sell their master limited partnership like a stock at a higher price than what they paid and in the meantime they earned a nice dividend okay so you do get preferential tax treatment from the federal government uh, in return for paying out 95 percent of your income unlike regular partnerships which are illiquid it's very difficult if you own a private partnership it's very difficult like owning a private business owning private stock, it's very difficult to find a buyer or a seller, but not so. These master limited partnerships are very liquid and they trade over the counter and on exchanges. And most of them actually trade on the American Stock Exchange. And so they are very liquid. So it's a way to own a partnership and, and get the benefit of partnership uh, investments and also get uh, have liquidity. All right, let's look at hedge funds. Hedge funds, like private equity, they've become really popular in the last few years. These are limited partnerships. They're set up as limited partnerships, and they raise cash from a limited number of wealthy investors. You know, there are minimums to get into these things, okay? And these partnerships have far less regulatory oversight than other investment organizations. So these firms uh, are not nearly, uh, they aren't regulated nearly as closely as mutual fund companies, okay? What does this do? Well, it lowers their compliance costs, regulations are expensive, and it also enables these companies to keep their investment holdings and their investment strategies secret. Okay? And there are as many strategies as there are hedge funds. There are thousands of hedge funds, small companies where investors get together, these investment managers get together and try to figure out special and unique ways to generate good returns. And so lots of different strategies, so you better understand what you're investing in. And it's hard to because they keep the strategies quiet, okay? Um, they often short securities, which means they're betting that security prices are gonna go down. And they often use leverage, futures, and options to enhance returns. So when you start talking about really complex strategies, you get them here uh, with hedge funds. Okay. Like private equity firms, they usually charge a fee, a management fee, which is a percentage of the value of the money invested. So they may say, okay, it, it, uh, uh, a minimum of uh, $200,000 uh, is required to invest in our fund, and we're going to charge you 2%, typically 2 and 20, 2% 2 a year on the 200000 so what's that, uh, $4,000 plus 20% of the profits of the fund go to the manager as well. So be very careful uh, uh, in reviewing the fee structure of these funds, okay? So they participate. Now, uh, in mutual fund companies cannot, by law, they cannot participate in the profits made by their portfolios. So it's, it's illegal. But if you set up as a hedge fund, as a limited partnership, you can. But 
If you set up as a limited partnership, there you are limited as to the number of shareholders you can um, take in. All right, usually a period of time during which investors cannot withdraw any money from the partnership. So again, like a private equity firm, you put your money in, you're locked in for a while. Okay. Unlike private equity funds, hedge funds most often invest in publicly traded securities, whereas private equity funds invest in private companies. Okay. And they rarely take controlling interest in their investments. Private uh, or hedge funds are not interested in adding value to the companies they invest in. They are interested in adding value by buying securities that either go up or down and they're betting in the right direction. All right, lastly, let's look at historical returns on investments. Um, we've looked at this before in Manfin. Let's look at, at it again. Large company stocks typically have returns of about 10% a year. Now that's an average rate of return, but if you look at how often you actually earn 10%, not very often, okay, with a risk of 22%. So the average, the, 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 the typical year is somewhere between 32% um, uh, high and 32% uh, low. One standard deviation above, one standard deviation below uh, the 10%. So I guess it's not, that's not true. It'd be 10% minus 22%, which is minus 12%, and 10% plus 22%, plus 32%. So plus 32% to minus 12% is what happens 90% um, of the time in the market. Okay? Small company stocks, higher return, 12% versus 10%, you're going, that's only two percentage points, that's a 20% increase in the return, but look at the increase in the risk, much higher uh, increase in the risk. So that's that would be 14% on 22%, so that's a 55 to 60% increase in the risk for a 20% increase in the gain by only small stocks. Here corporate bonds, much lower returns, 5.5%, much lower risk, much lower risk, and this is annual risk, annual returns, annual risk. Here are government bonds. Again, no credit risk here. You know you're going to get paid back, um, so it's a lower return, and the volatility, once again, is much lower. And then here, Treasury bills really short term, 3.5% return right now. Um, you're looking at 2% returns because interest rates are really low, but look at this. No risk. The risk-free rate right here. All right. What do I want you to take off of that chart? Note the risk return trade-off. I want you to know generally what, what stocks and bonds return and what the risk is. And note the risk return trade-off. Stocks return more but have higher volatility. Corporate bonds return uh, more uh, than government bonds but once again have higher volatility. And please understand correlations, how these things move together. And I'll show, I'll show you charts with more detail on it they show correlation, but in general, U.S. equities have low correlation with Asian equities. They usually don't move together, and U.S. equities have a low correlation with U.S. bonds. They usually don't move together, okay? Interest rates go up, and stock prices go down, and, um, uh, and bond prices actually, the prices go down. But there is a low correlation, typically, uh, between U.S. bonds and U.S. stocks. That's why you put them together in one portfolio, okay? Um, and real estate and gold also go their own way. So do you, if you want to hedge, if you want to manage your risk, if you want to lower your risk, then stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, international, that's the way to diversify a portfolio, okay? It is difficult to get good information on collectibles, okay? So you don't know what you're dealing with there. Very difficult. It's out there, but you have to work really hard to find it. Okay, so we are finished with Chapter 2, and we are ready to take a test. So uh, take a look at your homework. That will reinforce uh, these notes um, that I provided and presented to you. And, um, and if, if you're really um, energetic and ambitious, uh, then sit down and look at the, all the videos again. All right, we'll see you uh, at the exam. Good luck. Dr. E loves you.